This is probably the biggest presentation that I've ever done. Um, not in terms of number of audience, but the amount of content. Um, so I have trepidation about the world and our future. And I also have a little bit of trepidation about sharing this with some of you. Um, some of you need to hear this uh, for your work. And for those, I'm being compassionate by sharing this metasynthesis. But maybe for some others, I'm not being kind by, by sharing this. But I feel that in order to prepare and engage with the future, we have to understand it. Um, welcome. Thank you. So uh, I see some new faces that weren't at the, uh, the other presentations. So I'm going to do kind of a, a brief summary of sorts. Um, this will go probably an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and then we'll have um, Q&A. Again, this is the summary of 20 years of, of my work. Um, so we showed the film. We talked about human behavior in the brain. We talked about energy, technology, and money. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, we talked about the environment, not only climate, but biodiversity, plastics, other things. Today, I'm going to connect everything and how it fits together and what it implies for various future scenarios. In the Q&A, I would like to focus on understanding the problem and what various future scenarios might be and why. And we'll wait until Tuesday to talk about what to do. And I'm going to present my general ideas of the direction that we could go in our work, uh, in our nations, in our communities, and in our own lives. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to do a brief overview. I'm going to go through some popular myths in our society and um, some quick reality checks. I'm going to talk about the economic superorganism. And after that, I'm going to add a few more myths, which require that logic. I'm going to unpack what I refer to as the four horsemen of the 2020s. UD, when you hear them, you will definitely not be laughing. Um, and then, um, then I'm going to talk about four, four major uh, possible scenarios of the future that really parse down into two. Uh, and then a summary um, of the main points of the first uh, five sessions and looking ahead. So again, I've talked about a human ecosystem, how energy uh, and materials combine into technology and we represent this with money. We do this all to get the same emotional states of our ancestors and the whole process results in pollution. Um, can you see over there a little bit? Is it okay? All right. So no one knows the future, um, especially me. Um, so I view the world as a probability distribution. Um, the most likely things that I can imagine about the future are in the middle of my distribution. And then there's some things that are really bad that are slightly less likely and things that are really good that are less likely. My own distribution shifts every day based on what I learn, based on what happens in the world, based on my limbic system. So there is not one future. There are multiple, it's a probability distribution. And most people don't think that way. They think in binary, this is going to happen or that's not going to happen. But just so you know, the future is a, is a distribution which changes all the, the time. The challenge with this is as individual humans, we all have um, our own distributions of what the future is. And especially with artificial intelligence and disinformation in the media, our distributions don't overlap with that of other people, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this work, so that more of our distributions overlap with others and we can have a discourse. Um, if you're interested in this way of thinking, I made a video last year called Probability, Perception, and Reality. Okay, modern myths versus realities. Um, I have like 50 of these, and I think I only included 20 because I was in a hurry. Uh, but just to give you a flavor of what we've uh, gone over the last few sessions, the myth is that the experts have the answers. And the reality is that we live in a world uh, that has islands of expertise separated by oceans of non-science. We are part of a system and we need more generalists to understand if we fly up high enough and see how things fit together. 
myth in our society. Money and technology fully describe our wealth. Shown here is the classic economic um, uh, duo of labor and capital. Uh, but as we learned, uh, a barrel of oil has four and a half years of my physical work. Um, and we have around 400 to 500 billion human worker equivalents in fossil hydrocarbons. So every single good and service requires energy. No matter how you make a cup from a coconut or plastic or ceramic or steel, you need energy inputs. Oil is worth way more than the equivalent amount of $70 worth of these other things. So the entire fundamental economic formulas underpinning our economy are wrong. They're energy blind. And so our money and our machines are both dependent on energy. And 82% of our energy comes from non-renewable fossil energy. Myth, society runs on money. Well, it actually runs on energy per unit time. And energy per unit time is called power. So power is how much energy you get when you're burning energy instantaneously in time. This is a logarithmic chart that shows the correlation between energy consumption per unit time and GDP. And you can see that it's quite track line. Here's India, United States, way up there. Myth, drilling holes is sustainable. This is uh, Wyoming, United States, um, and uh, hi. Um, so we talked about this, that energy depletes, and we have different stories that technology can overcome this depletion, and so far in many cases it has, but the reality is, is that this technology like shale oil, et cetera, um, is largely acting as a bigger straw and so we're getting more liquid out at the top and we're viewing that as a success, but we're that much closer to the slurping sound. And this yeah. is generally true um, globally. So we're drawing down the principle which supports our economic systems, but our narration in the media, in our business schools, in politics, it, this is the interest because innovation and technology will always overcome any resource scarcity. Myth, money is real. Well, money is merely a marker for real things. It's a marker for natural capital, social capital, built capital, and human capital. But since our modern culture is energy blind, money is real, but it's a claim on future energy and resources. So all the rupees in your pocket or in your bank account, when you spend them, you're gonna spend them on something that required energy. And by the way, before I go further, I should say that um, the people that invited me here have no idea what I'm going to say today. So if I say things that are outrageous or upsetting, that's entirely on me. Uh, no one has seen this presentation before. Um, myth, the American, <laughs> the American dream is based on hard work. Um, the United States has used more oil, coal, and natural gas in the last 10 years, in the last 50 years, in the last 100 years, since the dawn of time, than any other country in the world. And now, after listening to these lectures, you can see how powerful um, this oil, coal, and natural gas is. The United States was blessed with a geology. These are all places that used to be ancient shallow oceans and have lots of oil and gas. So American wealth is not a birthright, but mostly based on fossils, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Myth, technology will solve everything somehow. Well, as we talked about on Tuesday, technology in most cases is just building a higher baseline for demand for energy in the next period. Myth, the invisible hand of Adam Smith has a plan for the future. When Adam Smith wrote his famous book, Wealth of Nations, 200 years ago, there was no end to resource growth in sight. And he actually 
foresaw that at one point his models would no longer work when we exhausted um, the non-renewable resources. But growth is a recent and rare phenomenon, especially of this magnitude in human history. There were long 500 year periods, 300 year periods where we had flat to declining growth in all of our economic assumptions of how the world works were created in this last 50 year period. So economic theory taught in business schools around the world where 25% of 246 million college students go into business as a major, marketing or accounting or something. Economic theory has no plan B and its plan A has an expiration date, which I'm gonna talk about. I have no idea how that got in here. I was like <laughs> juggling stuff around. <laughs> That's my dog, Maisie. Yeah. Um, hum myth, humans are mostly selfish. Um, that is somewhat of a reality in our current culture, but the reality is, is that humans historically are largely egalitarian and cooperative. We intensely formed in-group bonds for most of our existence, for 96% of our existence, we had no wealth to carry with us at all. Um, our wealth was in our relationships and in the natural world. And it was only from the agricultural revolution onwards that we stored wealth and from that created hierarchy, et cetera. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Microeconomics is based on how humans really are. Well, we evolved to be wrong and we have a list of cognitive biases as long as my arm. But the reality is, is that humans are non-rational and we are not self-interested utility maximizers. We are extremely other regarding. Some of you sit on corners smiling at passersby and watch what that does. You can't help but smile. Our mirror neurons get triggered when someone is smiling at us. We are not what the economic textbooks say of homo economicus. We care about other people and other people define who we are. Myth, money, GDP, and stuff are what make us happy. When you get home, um, go to Google and type in, why is everyone else? Why is everyone else so lucky? Why is everyone else better than me? Why is everyone else happy but me? Why is everyone else so pretty? Why is everyone else in a relationship but me? These are the most common things on Google. And why is everyone else so stupid? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, there, there was that. There are some exceptions. There are some exceptions. Um, but, but this, you know, we're living in one of the richest times, and Google is a United States company in one of the richest countries in the world, and most people are freaking miserable. So money and GDP, uh, despite our progress or the progress of a small percentage of us has not led to well-being uh, for most of us or for uh, other species, which I'll talk about. So from a biological sense, in our current culture, we seek money. Why? Basic needs, food, shelter, health care, to experience or stockpile novelty and comfort, which is, of course, linked to dopamine and neurotransmitters, for relative status comparisons. The vast majority of energy and consumption is for this last bit, relative status comparison, comparing ourselves to other humans in what the culture says is success. So 20 years ago, actually 25 years ago, I worked on Wall Street, and this is me on graduation day from the University of Chicago. And I, met, I went to make a lot of money and be with all the successful people. And then I quit and started reading books about ecology and 15 years ago, my father, who's one of my best friends, would introduce me to his friends as his environmental wacko son, <laughs> as if I was no longer successful because I wasn't pursuing money. So this is a huge driver of the message we're sending to young people of what it means to succeed. And we do, as I showed this the other day, as a person or a nation is poor, you get massive hedonic well-being development benefits from more energy. 
But once you get to around 100 gigajoules per capita, it levels off and more is just creating this dopamine treadmill. You can see India has a long way to go to get to some of these other nations. So money, um, here's Guatemala, 7,000 per year, Kuwait, 10 times as much, and they're equal on the happiness index. Um, so it, it, yes, we need basic things, but above that, culture dictates um, our well-being, et cetera, et cetera. So after basic needs are met, the best things in life are free. Here's me reading a book to my dog at night. This is my two best friends. This is Sammy, and you can see this is uh, my porch at Aditi Griha. Uh, this was at uh, Meha's class the other day with the six-year-olds here, some of our coaches and, and participants in our mandala. <laughs> Myth, the environment is a subset of the economy. This is what's taught in economic textbooks. The reality is the economy is a wholly dependent uh, on the environment. Myth, humans are the only species that matter. Um, we don't include them in our economic system, but there are other forms of conscious life um, that have followed similar evolutionary paths to get to this day. Humans are one of 10 million species on this planet, and we don't uh, often think about that. This is a bowhead whale, and they live to be 250 years old at least. How do we know that? because they found some uh, that died uh, recently and they had spear points in them from the late 1700s. Wow. Uh, and they're having conversations under the ice about who knows what. They have incredibly large brains and consciousness. Um, so this is not something that we think about when we go through our economic decisions. Myth, we're headed for a Star Trek future. In my opinion, we're living a Star Trek future right now. Um, and that the reality is, and I'll get to that shortly, is we're headed for an Earth Trek future. Heaven and GDP are what we should aspire to as a country, as a species. I talked about the pulse in CO2, which keeps increasing, and the uh, impacts to our ecosystems and climate that are still ahead of us. And we're all alive during this uh, fragile and incredible time near the top of this carbon pulse. Um, and I believe that this earth is heaven, metaphorically, if not in reality, and that there's nothing more sacred than the living earth. So in my opinion, we're gonna need new stories of humans and earth going forward. Okay, to the main point of today's talk, we talked about the human ecosystem. How does all of that fit together? And we keep score of this system every quarter, every year, by something called GDP, which is globally GWP, which stands for Gross World Product. Every single good and service that is in the global economy started somewhere with a small fire. So we might as well call it gross world burning, GWB. And we talked the other day about starlings, or actually I think it was this morning, I forget. Starlings um, follow three simple rules. Do what your neighbor does, don't get too close, and fly to the center. And those three simple rules create these emergent properties in the sky of these beautiful, they're called murmurations of starlings. Um, so there's something in biology called Kleber's law, which says that the energy use or the metabolism of an organism, whether it's a mouse or a frog or an elephant or a blue whale, is its size to the three quarter power. And it turns out that if you aggregate all the human countries in the world, the size of our economy, uh, the energy use is the size to the three quarter power. This is a biological law being expressed at human levels. So I'm gonna read a quote now. <clears throat> what took place in the early 1500s was truly exceptional, something that never happened before and never will again. 
two cultural experiments running in isolation for 15,000 years at last came face to face. Amazingly, after all that time, each could recognize the other's institutions. When Cortez landed in Mexico, he found roads, canals, cities, palaces, schools, law courts, markets, irrigation works, kings, priests, temples, artisans, astronomers, merchants, sports, theater, art, music, and books. High civilization, differing in detail but alike in essentials, had evolved independently on both sides of the earth. This is from a book called A Short History of Progress by Ronald Wright. So humans also follow simple rules in our modern system. We coordinate as individuals, as families, as small businesses, as corporations, as nation states, as a global system to acquire surplus, profits and surplus. We pursue culturally accepted behavior and we spend the surplus. So the emergent property looks something like this. This is uh, Tallahassee, Florida, an aerial view where there is a, a, a scaling metabolism of structures similar to Cortez founded Mexico, but now at a, at a much larger scale. So this is an aerial view of Los Angeles. And the brake lights and the headlights are not too dissimilar than the veins and the arteries in our bodies, except the blood or the hemoglobin in this case is being powered by gasoline and diesel in our global system. And this has created a just-in-time, six-continent, globally connected transportation system. So my academic work has likened global human culture to an energy dissipating structure. It's blind, it's unthinking, it's powered by the financial markets, and it's sloughing forward in time trying to access more power, which is energy, uh, akin to a blind amoeba. So what happened over time is, this is, by the way, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, and if any of you have seen it, the, the Eye of Sauron in, in Mordor uh, was kind of all-seeing and, and, and powerful. So this is from one of my videos that we, event, we, we eventually stopped hunting gathering, and we started to acquire agricultural surplus. That turned into fossil fuels uh, and how powerful they were for our, our nations and our world um, in the last 200 years. Then we created money, digital money and, and paper money, which could act as a concentrator of wealth, uh, an immediate uh, transmutation of digits into real things. And now we're moving to artificial intelligence, which is optimizing all this stuff incredibly rapidly. It's like a turbo boost to all this other stuff. So there is no one driving the bus, um, not politicians, not the rich or powerful. We might think they are, um, and they probably have a lot more responsibility for what to do in the future, but this is an emergent phenomenon. So from a climate change standpoint, uh, we can look at all the um, climate change conferences the last 30 years, and we can look at our energy growth. And if I was an alien that didn't know anything about this culture, I might think that the climate conferences were actually causing this energy <laughs> growth. Um, so there's a metabolism. So trying to mitigate climate change within our existing economic structures is like arguing with a forest fire. We just a few months ago hit all-time highs in coal production. India earlier this week announced plans to double its coal production, ignoring the climate threat. And you can't blame them because the economy is, is growing and you need power, you need energy. And they didn't have access to the energy that the United States and the West did in earlier times, which brings up another sensitive issue is we have multiple overlapping objectives. Climate change is a real and existential issue. Economic growth is very important and inequality or equity. We politically have this concept called net zero, which seems to be able to incorporate all these things. But the reality is, is that we can't 
optimize for all of these three things simultaneously. Pick two, pick two of them, as evidenced by plans like President Biden, Richie Sunak in the UK are both very well aware of climate, and yet they're pursuing new leases to drill oil in the North Sea and in Alaska, et cetera. We, our economies need the power to continue what we have. So this artificial intelligence is something that we're just starting to learn about. Um, some of our friends are working closely on this, on, on the risks associated with this. What I'm hearing is there will be a couple 300 AIs in the world, mostly owned by rich people or militaries that funnel resources and try to optimize things in a way that's not good for the rest of humanity. So I really do think that AI is going to be in service of the Eye of Sauron in the same way that the superorganism has acted as a larger straw on Earth's ecosystems, AI potentially is gonna function as an even larger straw. So under this framing, what is not likely to happen, growing the economy and mitigating climate change in the sixth mass extinction, growing the economy by replacing fossil fuels with renewables. Renewables are growing much faster than fossil fuels right now, but globally we are growing fossil fuels at a higher amount than renewables as evidenced by recent coal. What's not gonna happen is culture en masse choosing to leave fossil carbon in the ground. We know it's polluting, we know it's causing climate change, let's leave it in the ground. I don't think we're gonna do that en masse. Governments embracing limits to growth before limits to growth are well past. Under this superorganism framing, what is likely to happen? Growth in gross energy while the net energy declines. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Massive monetary creation and financial market supports by central banks and governments, and this has already been happening since 2009. Wider and deeper poverty um, all around the world. Basic income support for more people, like the maintenance idea in Oroville. A rightward shift in politics. Why? Because the population is not evenly distributed in their big five temperament traits, and a lot of people are not open to new experiences. And when we experience stress, a lot of people prefer to go back to the way things were. And there will be politicians promising that, even if they can't deliver, because this is not a political problem we face. This is an ecological and systems problem. Uh, reduction in global environmental regulations, because we're going to need the energy. Um, and pedal to the metal until we hit a wall. Okay, so based on the superorganism, I have a few more myths that, uh, that I wanted to throw in there. Myth, green growth is possible globally. Well, we cannot decouple physical growth from energy and materials. We can decouple growth from carbon use, but only at lower levels of fruit throughput. So green growth is still growth, not green and not sustainable, shown here as the base of a wind turbine and the very complicated uh, polysilicon plants. What's happening is someone's fault. The Republicans, the Democrats, uh, the people in the Middle East, the tree huggers, the rich, the Chinese. Um, the reality is, is that what's happening is biophysical and ecological. And as I said before, I've come to the conclusion that what's happening is no one's fault. But once we're aware of it, we're complicit. And I think there are 1,500, 2,000 human beings that have an incredibly large outsized responsibility to, because of their capabilities, to intervene on behalf of the future. And that's one of the things I hope to influence in, in coming years, because our ability to change this superorganism is not equally distributed. The system is too huge. What can one person do? Well, uh, anthropologist Margaret Mead famously said that individuals and small groups are the only things that ever do change uh, the future. <laughs> Myth, it's too late, we're doomed. Many benign and wonderful futures are still possible. Possible doesn't mean easy or guaranteed. What is possible still needs help visualizing and actualizing. That's gonna be what I talk about on Tuesday. The U.S. Constitution is the correct document for the future, as one example. 
Humans have had many documents and social contracts, all the way back from the Cave of the Hands, the Code of Hammurabi, Syntagma Square in Greece, the Magna Carta, of the US Constitution, based on the reality of the time. So we now live on a full planet with no historical ecological analog. And the reality is we are approaching a species level conversation. Um, perhaps these conversations and similar ones scaled can act as the mitochondria of a new type of culture. Okay, the four horsemen of the coming decade. Um, so there's a lot of uh, people who are aware of the things that I've been discussing and they want to degrow the economy or have some new political um, scheme to make things more equitable or get rid of all fossil fuels by buying up the coal plants and retiring them or all kinds of things that we should do this. My work is more focused on what we're gonna have to do as opposed to what we should do because I think there's a momentum and a metabolism of what's been set in motion that has got a certain inevitability to it. And that's what I wanna shift the conversation to now. So the first horseman is the financial overshoot, the financial bend or break moment. If we recall from Tuesday, the uh, green is sustainable flows, the red is non-renewable resources like copper or oil, and we create money with no tether to how much non-renewable resources are left. So we're creating debt much faster than we create GDP, which is the income stream needed to uh, maintain and service the debt, thus stretching our tether to reality. And eventually that tether will snap back like a rubber band. So the highest growth rate in human history peaked 50 years ago, which was exactly the time when oil growth peaked so we're still growing, we still have productivity, anything above zero is productivity. We're, we're making our labor and capital more productive. And a large reason this, because we've been adding more incredibly powerful energy every year. But you can see that the productivity is increasing, but at a declining level. <coughs> at some point, when energy supplies start to decline, we won't be able to have global or national productivity. Um, and the reason that we're able to do this now, in addition to adding more energy, is we're adding more debt. We're basically consuming on a credit card. Let's start with China. China is now just the government debt, not the private, municipal, um, and, and uh, corporate debt, is over 300% of GDP. So just imagine yourself that you make $50,000 uh, um, a year or whatever number it is. And if you owe the bank 150,000 and they're charging you interest on your growing amount that you owe them, that would be somewhat unsustainable. But our whole global system is like that. Uh, and China is among the worst uh, because they've followed the Western model and they're a communist country. So the government has, has created all this credit. It's, it's a real danger. Um, these are the other main large central banks. So from 20 years ago, we've increased the amount of uh, central bank credit. Central banks are basically act, acting as hedge funds. They will see a, finan a problem in the financial market and they'll say, here's a trillion dollars. And that we as a central bank, we have a trillion dollar uh, asset, but they only have like $50 billion of paid in capital. So central banks, from a monetary perspective, okay, they're big daddy, they can handle this. But from an energy and resource perspective, this is the biggest bubble in the history of the world. And they keep adding more and more credit to keep the system afloat. So what we're doing is we're papering over our problems with more and more credit, while the energetic and material basis for our currencies deplete. Okay, I'm gonna spend three or four minutes on a concrete example so that you understand this. So this, pretend you're an individual um, and that you make $100,000 or 100,000 rupees or whatever it is per year, but you spend more than that. You spend another 30,000. So you need to borrow money from the bank. Um, you do this and the red line is your disposable income. 
And it declines over time because the amount of interest you owe the bank increases over time. So by the time you get to year five, you're borrowing money from the bank just to consume at the level you originally started at because you have to pay a lot of interest to the bank. Then you're in year six and you start to have, oh my gosh, I'm only able to spend 98,000 because I owe the bank so much. And the difference between year six and year seven is the bank says, you know what, Gizen, I'm not gonna loan you any more money. And the second that that happens, your income and your spending power drops precipitously. This is what I think is gonna to happen to the global economy because we can't continue to pay back these claims um, with energy resources the way that they are now. Um, it might take 10 years from now, I don't know, um, but this has happened many times in human history in the past. It happens to Argentina and places like that all the time. It's just not happened at a global level. So this is what I call the, the financial bender break. The second horseman is one that I'm reluctant to discuss because few of us have agency in this, but I think in the 1970s, it was discussed all the time and in the 1960s. And now we just kind of sweep it under the rug. Um, but we have a serious geopolitical problem in the world now. We've gone from a unipolar world of the United States, and you could argue the UK and maybe Australia and European countries, to now a multipolar world where Russia, China, India, Brazil, there are other countries that have a lot of uh, economic and military power. There are 13,000 nuclear warheads uh, in the world. Um, just a few of those would unleash catastrophic uh, damage. 50 or 100 of them would block out the sun for five to seven years and cause mass death on the planet, even if you weren't in the country where the nuclear bomb went off. This morning, Med Medvedev, who's the deputy director of uh, Russia's military, warned the United States that if Ukraine launches Western missiles into Russia, they will respond with nuclear. So I don't believe that anyone is saying, yeah, let's have a nuclear war. They're not planning for that because they know what I just said. But the way that these things happen in the world is that someone does this and then it escalates and all of a sudden it's out of control. So we're living in a world now where this is not a negligible risk and how, what's going on with all the aircraft carriers and everything. And earlier, the, between my last talk and now, the US and the UK bombed Yemen and Iran supports the uh, Ansar Allah rebels in, in Yemen. And so now this is really about the US and UK versus Iran, and then Israel's involved, and it's a freaking mess. It is not the way it used to be 30 or 40 years ago, because now, these things that I'm talking about today are not secrets. Um, so governments of the world are aware of these things. I'll skip that. Um, another aspect of this is the complexity of our world. Way, way more complex than it's ever been in the past. The average supermarket has 120,000 SKUs, which is the scanning number for a certain product, you know, different shampoo bottles or spark plugs or light bulbs or whatever it is. And we have a six continent just in time supply chain. 80% of the active pharmaceutical agreements for the, uh, ingredients for the United States come from India or China. The United States has 50% of the world's medical prescriptions and 4% of the world's population. Is that because we're sicker or because we're babies or because of the economic system, the doctors are writing more prescriptions or some combination? But we have used this comparative advantage that you learn in economic theory that if some country is good at getting bananas or butter, they can specialize and everyone, this country does just butter and this country does just bananas and the whole world is better off. And that's true. But what, we, what we've neglected is that specialization has caused brittle, non-resilient manufacturing in a lot of areas. And we depend on cheap oil and cheap credit to import these things from around the world, assuming that this will continue to happen indefinitely. So complexity is a huge risk. 
The fourth risk is the social contract. And I know nothing about India, but the United States is slowly but inexorably headed towards a, a civil war. It, I, I can't describe it any different. We don't read the same news. Uh, the left and the right aren't having the same discussions. We've got two senile sociopaths running for the highest office in our country uh, later this year. It's just an unbelievable situation. I'll say this even though I'm on camera. If the U.S. were to collapse, it would take most of the rest of the world down with it because of how the military and because of how intricate it is with the supply chains uh, and, and the complexity. Now, five-year warning, and that could be totally changed. But everything is interconnected right now. And uh, I just, I don't see how this conversation is gonna change. I'm hopeful that someone will come out of the, the blue and, and run for president that's balanced and can unite the nation. Um, but it, right now it's not happening. And that's because of the vested power of the two political power parties and because of uh, information, disinformation. So the reason I bring all this up, which is very uncomfortable and depressing to talk about, is when we plan about the future, we have to keep in mind that these four things are, are risks that we live with right now, and they're all interrelated to each other. So any destabilizing event in the world, like a political crisis, some political party comes and implements degrowth or does a debt jubilee, um, or any black swans will likely trigger some variation of these risks. Um, so this is, you know, Again, I, this is the analysis that I've come to, and even my 19-year-old students in my class, I feel bad about sharing this, and yet I treat them as peers, and I want to just treat them as human beings on the planet and share what I see. How could I be wrong? I could be wrong many ways. We could have uh, new technology that boosts productivity and kicks these problems down the road some more. We could have a change in consciousness, uh, which would be wonderful. I don't know how to do that other than put psilocybin in the water supply all over the world. But um, there, there could be ways that we boost productivity a while longer. But boosting productivity is still going to be a problem for global ecosystem. Speaking of which, there is a fifth horseman that is disconnected from those four but is the ecological damage that is ongoing and the climate and the oceans, which are going to be getting worse in our lifetimes just from what's happened before. And those other four things are triggered. This may improve or not, um, but this is ongoing as we're gonna see in the next six months with the, the spike of El Nino and uh, the lack of aerosols for temperature and climate probably. Um, okay. So what are the scenarios of the future? There's really four scenarios, but I'm gonna parse it into two. One is green growth, which is that we invent technologies that are able to um, pay back the debt of the past and maybe even green the earth um, and grow the economy and um, create more wealth, equality, et cetera. I see nothing on the horizon that fits those things. We can have growth, but it's gonna be brown growth, um, which I refer to as the Mordor economy. So let me explain what the Mordor economy is. This is a chart of economic growth in the world the last 200 years. There was a famous guy named Thomas Malthus who lived 200 years ago, and he infamously predicted that humans were gonna run out of resources because our exponential demand for population and growth and, and consumption would outstrip the linear demand of crop production. Malthus was wrong because he didn't know about mining underground coal, oil, and natural gas, which gave a big boost to our global system. In 1969, my friend Paul Ehrlich wrote a book called The Population Bomb saying many of the same things. He was wrong because he didn't know about outsourcing in the world to the uh, areas of least cost production, nor did he know about debt. Because from 1969 to today, we've grown our debt more than we've grown our GDP in every single year. So those things allowed a can to be kicked. 
In two. Question about that. Uh, you haven't mentioned near. <coughs> huh? You have not mentioned near shoring then, because. Yeah, let's do. Let's hold the questions till the end, because I'm. Does, that does not uh, have any impact. Oh, sure it does, but on average, no, no. that hasn't. That's been dwarfed by outshoring. Near shoring is certainly happening, but as a percentage of our total trade, the outshoring is is way dominant. Nearshoring is what we're going to have to do. That's one of the responses. Um, in 2009, we had the great financial crisis, and the central banks of the world took over the, the monetary creation role from the commercial banks. And they've been doing fingers in the dike, artificial temporary guarantees in the financial system since then. 2020 was COVID. The central banks had to come back in and do stimulus and guarantees and send out $1,500 checks to every American. I don't know what happened in India, but there were uh, emergency measures to keep things going. What are the future cans to kick? Maybe uh, there's some new technology, maybe blockchain or artificial intelligence will boost our productivity. Maybe we'll have a change in consciousness and the next can to kick is one to open, not to kick. But what this means is that if we continue to grow, the rule of doubling is you take 70 divided by the growth rate. All governments in the world expect us to grow at 3% a year going forward, which means in the next, by the year 2050, we will double everything, the energy materials in the world. And by the year 2080, we will quadruple the energy materials in the world. So what will happen is, and this is what I wrote my PhD in, so this is something that I actually have thought about and, and looked at a lot. This is a graph showing the percentage of the economy, in this case, England, um, that was dedicated to the energy sector. So back here in the year 1300, like 60 or 70% of the economy was getting energy and only 30% was used by the citizens. And so we found fossil fuels and then there was this massive drop until the low was 1999, where we only use 5% of our energy to find and deliver and refine and, and get energy to everyone else, which meant 95% of humans' energy could be colleges and football stadiums and airports and shopping centers and all that other stuff. Now, this is around 10 to 12% of our energy is going to the energy sector. And the reason I refer to it as a Mordor economy is I believe more and more of our energy will be directed towards the energy and mining sector, which will leave less and less for everything else. So when energy was 5% of our economy, that's energy extract, these three things. Then we have food, basic industry, infrastructure, military, hospitals, education, consumer goods, jobs, art, novelty, free time. But in the mortar economy, these things are gonna take a lot more of our energy. So by the time we get to here, all these other things are gonna get this amount of energy. They're gonna get priced out of how things used to be. And we're gonna, barring anything else, this will be rationed to society by price, which means a lot of those things will not be affordable unless there's some political change. So the Mordor economy is more of our economy is directed towards energy, mining, and environmental mitigation. The third scenario is the name of my podcast uh, and the name of my work. Uh, I refer to it as a great simplification. Humans solve problems by creating technology and innovation, and that innovation results in more complexity, and that complexity requires a larger energy spigot and over time, we have complexified by growing the amount of energy. And once energy starts to stabilize and go down, the first thing that will happen is we have to deal with the financial uh, uh, overhang, but we're going to have a simplification. And the easiest way to think about it is, um, I think one of the next three recessions will be a depression. We had a recession in 2020. We had a recession in 2009, those were able to be uh, stopped by emergency responses from central banks and governments. One of the next ones won't be, and it'll be a much deeper 
um, depression sort of thing. Um, which is why uh, Oroville in many ways is so much more resilient than other places because you don't need a lot of stuff to live your lives and, and be happy because a lot of the ways you get your neurotransmitters are from community and food and singing and, and things like that. Whereas the average city in America is not like that. So when we remove low productivity credit uh, with a shift towards lower productivity energy and resources, meaning more costly shale oil that costs $100 or $200 a barrel, and with a return to full, full cost um, solar panels, for instance, um, that will no longer be able to maintain our financial claims on reality, and there will be a, a decline. The fourth category is Mad Max, um, which is that we don't manage to stabilize these things. Um, and we lose the complexity of our current system. I actually think it's these two are the ultimate choices that over time, everything parses in into these and that's what the work I'm doing. Okay, uh, a brief summary. Main points, cheap abundant fossil fuel energy underpins our societies and our expectations, but this is a stock that our culture has treated as a flow. Growth is probably soon over, and the first major challenge is responding to a financial recalibration. Again, this presentation is largely created for Western audiences. I think the situation rhymes, but is quite different in India. I just don't know enough about India to um, really talk about it uh, beyond the top level. Rather than choose austerity, which is tightening our belts and saying we need to consume less, Governments and central banks will print and monetize debt, eventually leading to currency debasement. So the United States will try to inflate our debt away, uh, which means that poorer people that have very little money in the bank and that's their savings are gonna get hurt again because that money, if they have $10,000 saved up in the bank, will be worth less as more dollars and things are printed. We do not face a resource shortage, but rather a longage of expectations. Again, speaking to uh, the Western world, we use a hundred times more energy than our bodies need. So if we go down to 80 times in a great depression or something, we still are one of the richest material generations in history. It's just we've built a society around expectations that are not sustainable and don't make us healthy. And we're just kind of going in a really unhealthy direction. Renewable energy, nuclear technology, these are the things we're going to need. They're the right answers to the wrong question. The question that we're addressing is how can we continue to grow the, the economy by using these things? The right question to ask is how can we use our declining fossil fuels as seed corn in tandem with more sustainable technology towards a lower throughput human uh, collaborative existence. But no one is asking that question because perhaps it's too threatening to, to ask it. There is a biophysical phase shift occurring in the global economy, politics and alliances. Um, India is teaming up with Russia, Brazil, China. China is doing the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, there's military presence in the Middle East. This is all this great game of risk that is happening in real time because of these underlying uh, issues. Climate change, and I talked a lot about that on Tuesday, climate change is not the problem, but a symptom of a larger uh, human overshoot and a systems problem that uh, I've been talking about these last lectures. What I'm saying today, this complex predicament cannot yet be voiced aloud in politics and media uh, because there are no easy answers to this. There actually are no solutions to this. There are only responses. And that's what I'm gonna talk about on, on Tuesday. Our current resource tech situation can power a great culture and civilization, just not this one. Here's one of my favorite quotes, which drives some of my work. When a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence can shift the entire system. So um, 
I'm, I'm going to close there for today. On Tuesday, I'm going to have vertical and horizontal maps for what do we do uh, going forward. And it is somewhat hopeful, but it's also realistic. So if we think about um, the cultural conversations that this is the past, 99% of businesses and philanthropists and people are planning for this line to continue. There are virtually no one planning on what is the um, bender break moment and how do we stabilize once these events start to happen? Or what are the long term, looking two or three steps ahead, what are the things that our communities need to be doing? And I'm going to talk about those things uh, on Tuesday. That's all I had. Thank you for bearing through this intense. <laughs> Questions, comments, disagreements? Um, there was a chart that says like when we use 15% of our mm. energy to seek energy, we have a lot less space to spend energy on things that... that yes, even, even if the economy is larger, that, yes. What is that timeline? I don't know. Well, it's happening right now. I mean, you see it happening all around. Right now we're at like 12%, and I think in our lifetime, we'll go to 15 or 18 percent or something like that. Um, it, it's happening right now, which is why some of these events are happening in the world that were Norway just approved to uh, mine the seabed, the, the floor of the sea to get copper nodules, uh, um, which we need for renewable energy and electric cars and such. It's called the Abyssal Ocean. And we we're doing those sorts of things. So we are expanding the biophysical footprint where we used to not have to worry about that. For instance, copper used to be 70% uh, copper nodules, and now it's like in the single digits. The same with iron ore, it's all, uh, the, the grade is going down, so we need more energy and more land, et cetera. But as far as the timeline, the timeline that is relevant to all these things is the Four Horsemen. It might last another decade. Um, I don't think so. I, I think two to seven years sort of thing, um, but, I, but I don't know. Um, but it's the military and it's the finance and then the resulting complexity. Namu. Um, so the Mordor economy is based on the idea that we will still try to have the same level of comfort and lifestyle, right? Our, our economies. Yeah. So if we instead like, I guess then the great simplification is if we don't, if we decide as a community not to spend all the energy and then go back to like, I don't know, <coughs> shitting in buckets and making your own food, then the, is well, it also possible that the amount of energy that we need is actually just for food and basic necessities? You, you're conflating two things. And I understand your question. You said community. I'm talking about the world. So communities, and I'll talk about this Tuesday, communities could choose to simplify first and beat the rush. And I would argue that European nations are going to have to do this ahead of other places because of what's happening with natural gas, um, where they'll have to make do in different ways. The difference between India and Germany, of course, is Germany uses eight times more energy. So it's, it's, a, it's a different situation. As individuals and as communities, we can choose to act ahead of this. The global situation can't, we can't shrink. There's a metabolism. And if we did, if we had the political will that the whole world said, you know what, we're destroying the oceans and the climate and this is unsustainable and let's put a carbon tax on and let's change our values to well-being instead of economic growth. If that happened, we would still have the four horsemen because that would cause the uh, monetary um, uh, musical chairs thing to, to stop. So we still have to, no matter what sustainable path we might like or plan for, we're going to have to go through those four horsemen, in my opinion. The, the other point about it, one nation decides to take down its consumption, then the effect of it on the military and therefore the unlikelihood of that being and well, here's the other thing. What if Germany or France or someone decided, oh, we agree with everything that Nate said. We're going we're gonna to get started ahead of time. 
they would be outcompeted by everyone else who would still have access to the global supply chains, et cetera, which is why, which is why that's not happening. It's all or nothing sort of dynamic. Because if there's at least one country that's still trying to do that, they'll just try to take over the entire the rest of the world. This is why geopolitics and power in the eye of Sauron is a really crappy dynamic, but I think it's, it's real. And my country is the most guilty by far. Uh, UD will come back to you in a second because there's some other hands. Yes, Yajin, and then you. What's Luxembourg doing? <laughs> uh, drinking beer and. Uh, Why were they so yeah. high up on that chart? Yeah. Which chart? In, towards the beginning. Oh, I mean, it's a really tiny population. Uh, all of the Scandinavian countries have a very high well being because they have a Scandinavian socialism. They have the basic needs covered for most people. And a lot of them have huge land masses with very small populations. Norway has a trillion dollar. Uh, national piggy bank because of the oil revenues from the North Sea. I mean, every, every country has its own different, um, you know, bells and whistles. But Luxembourg is like not much bigger than Oroville, you know, I mean, it's a pretty small place. Yeah, yes. Two people, what's your view of Robert Kennedy running for president? You only mentioned the two sociopaths. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Um, I think he's a breath of fresh air in, in that he really cares about um, things and he's telling the truth on a lot of things. I disagree with him on a couple things, but I feel that he's a real person and some of our friends have spoken with him. I don't think he has a chance of winning because the Democrat, well, he's already chosen to be an independent. But the power structure in the political situation it just won't allow that. I've actually been convinced, though, that his running originally I thought would favor Trump, and now I think it favors Biden because he will take voters away from Trump. But I, I wish there was a third party person that would run. Okay, so you're not giving any weight to it yet. I mean, according to him, he's leading in young people, but I don't know how many percentage Maybe. Of people are <laughs> compared Maybe. to older people like me. Yeah. And one more person, Jim Bendel, do you know? Jim I know Jim. You know Jim? Yeah. Okay. But breaking Together is his book and yeah. about being together while the breaking is happening. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. He heavily referenced me in that book, okay. um, if you read it. I haven't read it very far yet. Okay. <laughs> yes. When the finances bend or break, what happens to money in the bank? A reasonable question. Uh, so the government of Cyprus a few years ago um, had financial problems and Cyprus was known for being a bug out place for Russian tycoons to park their money outside of Russia. And their response was bail-ins that anyone that had over $10 million, the banks took 90% of it. Anyone that had 1 million, they took 60%. Between 100,000 and a million, they took 30%. And under 100,000, they took 10% in order to make the banking system solvent. Wow. That's one path. Um, another path is the banks would all fail and have to be nationalized by the government. I think that's more likely. Um, it's already starting to happen in the United States <laughs> that a lot of people don't trust having their money. So they're moving their money out of the small banks to move it into the, the major four money center banks, Wells Fargo and uh, Bank of America and JP Morgan, uh, which are all really tightly linked to the US government and guaranteed. But what, we're fa what we faced in 2009 was a too big to fail situation. What we face in the next decade is a too big to save situation. For instance, if Marine Le Pen were to get elected in France, she wants to get out of the euro. If the euro stopped, there would be an immediate bend or break collapse because the central banks of the world don't have enough money to bail out France um, as one example. And that's horribly complex. But the, the, the musical chairs example is, is reasonably apt, especially since all of us believe that money is real. Um, 
And this is why I don't talk about this publicly much because not, I mean, who the heck am I? But we trust. Trust is perhaps the thing that's most important of all of this stuff. We trust that these rupees or dollars, I can take them anywhere in the world and exchange them for things. And if that trust breaks, then we have real problems. So I'm, I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying that that's a reasonable chance that something like that will happen, like it happened in other countries. Now, of course, um, there are people that believe in something called modern monetary theory, which is a more correct way of describing the plumbing of our uh, financial system. And it's true that the United States, and in India's case with rupees, the United States could technically never go broke because whatever we owe, the government and the treasury can just print. That is true. Now, not every country can say that. France can no longer say that because they have the euro, which is part of the European Union. The problem is two, three problems. One is that ignores the energy and resources, right? So you can print more money, but you cannot print more oil. You can only extract it faster. So that's one problem. Second problem is what is the carbon footprint of modern monetary theory? We're creating money from nothing from the US government, and it's being spent on real coal, oil, gas, and copper, and ocean acidification. But the third and possibly most relevant one is other countries start to lose faith in the viability of your treasury notes and, and things. So that I think that the warning signs of all this will happen in the fixed income markets as interest rates start to go up and people no longer believe in the um, either inflation or the ability to pay. And maybe we're a long ways away from that and maybe not. I, I don't know. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, Could Sandra. Just follow up on, on that. Um... Where, I mean, crypto takes up a lot of energy, but how does crypto... Yeah, so again, I don't want to focus on that because I don't think crypto is an answer to the issues that I'm facing, but I do think Bitcoin... Um, here's my view on Bitcoin. Two views. Yes, it takes a lot of energy to create the Bitcoin, but it's almost better than the creation of dollars anyways, because when dollars are created, they're printed on linen, and that requires very little energy. But the dollars come into existence from nothing, and they're immediately spendable on oil, coal, and gas. So those people saying, well, Bitcoin sucks because it uses energy, don't understand how much money, uh, how much energy our real money uses. That's point number one. Point number two is I do think Bitcoin and commodities are likely to go significantly higher as people in the world recognize that governments are going to continue to print money in response to the crises that I've laid out. So I think Bitcoin has a 50% chance of going to 500,000 and a 50% chance of going to zero, uh, but it's 43,000 now. So, but I'm focused on figuring out how humanity and the biosphere make it through the coming century. And so Bitcoin is not that interesting to me from that perspective. Um, but eventually we will need some currency. After the great simplification, we will need a global or national or local currencies. And the problem with our currencies now is they've not had a tether to anything physical. And gold is physical, yes, but gold also you can't eat it, it doesn't produce happiness or food or ecosystems. So I think energy is a more likely or, or productive capacity or land or something like that. Yeah, uh, Namu, you D, and then you, and then you Vinay. Um, how would Oroville fit into this scenario? Because you said like small villages can start the simplification early on, but the goal of Oroville is to kind of be the beaming light that the world will follow in course. How does that, how would that work? Like, would, would that work? I don't know enough about Orville to say, and I will talk about um, different trajectories and advice on Tuesday. Um, my brief guess is a couple different things. What happened in 2020 
it will rhyme with that. So whatever problems you faced in 2020 in Oroville, it's going to be something like that. Um, I think one of the risks to Oroville is it's beautiful. People love each other. There's great food. There's music. There's connection. There's spirituality. But there also are a million visitors coming through here every year that each spend a certain amount of rupees. And if there's a global upheaval in some sort of a, a four horsemen, you will still have the community and the food and all those things, but you won't have those million visitors. Um, so that's that's one that's one thing. Um, it seems like the people that are in charge of Oroville have well thought through the ecology and the the water tables and and things like that, which are most places in the United States have not. Um, so I think. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, between now and the Great Simplification, Oroville can act as a beacon and maybe do some public documentaries or something and get more people, more examples of this way of living. Because the ultimate thing we're going to have to do globally, we're going to have to use less energy and materials per human on average. Now, the average, the mean and the median is going to be messed up. As we know, it always has been. But on average, we're going to have to use less. People in Oroville don't use that much. A, fr a tiny fraction of what people in my city in Red Wing, Minnesota use because of the infrastructure, because of the behaviors where you have to drive a car 35 miles each way to work, um, you know, et cetera. So um, there are risks and opportunities that are unique to Oroville. And that's why I'm so glad that a lot of the people in the community are sitting here. And I'm here for two and a half more weeks. And if there's a talk that I could do with the senior people and at least expose them to this possibility. And this is to all of you. You don't have to agree with everything I've said here, but if what I've said is even 10% possible, well, how does that change your own outlook on your plans, your professional uh, path, what you care about, what speaks to you? And again, we'll talk more about that on, on Tuesday. Uh, UD, and then you. And then Vinay. Um, I have, I think, a couple questions. Um, you mentioned about United States is likely heading towards civil war. And then do you think it would not be safe towards the end of this year? And, and, then, and then, where, then where would be safe? And also I have a question about famine. Um, yeah. So, I mean, any, everyone that lives in the United States has an opinion. Um, I don't literally mean bayonets and gun civil war, though that could happen. The problem is, is no matter who wins the election, 30% of our citizens will not believe that the election was fair, no matter who wins. So you can predict that now. And so what happens then? I, I don't know. Um, I mean, as far as where is safe, I, I mean, I feel pretty safe in Oroville. I didn't even lock my bike when I came in here. <laughs> um, One of the things you might want to talk about is the increase in preppers and what wealth is doing in terms of investing in real assets. Oh, um, so there's something, uh, I'm not sure this is, uh, are you leaving or? Oh. Um, there's something called the Cantillon effect in economics, which is those people that are closer to the origin of money have outsized advantage. So very few people in the United States even own stocks. The stocks and bonds are predominantly owned by the top two to 5% of people and the wealth inequality within the top 2% is extreme. And then relative to the rest of the economy, it's also extreme. The United States have, has crushing poverty. 41% of households don't have enough to make ends meet. 41%, one of the richest countries in the world. Um, I had a podcast a couple weeks ago. It's called Alice. Asset limited, income constrained, but they still are employed. E. Um, so th th this is a real wealth inequality um, issue, both within countries and between countries. I don't know what you wanted me to say, Marley. The direction in which the wealth is moving in for to for the towards the great simplification, how they're buying into real asset. Oh yeah. So 
Lots of wealthy people understand this. They don't quite get the energy thing because most people are still energy blind. But I know of numerous billionaires that are buying bug out places on islands and they're expecting to survive the great simplification because they're rich. And I think it's ridiculous. We, we are going to sink or swim together. And so what? I have a good bug out place. What if I break my leg? Uh, which I almost did today when I hit a cow on my way over here, <laughs> like totally veered. Um, so we, um, we, we, we are in a moment where the people that have the power have an outsized responsibility to do something. And Chandra, why don't you say what you want to say? Because you <laughs> seem <laughs> <laughs> No, that, that the response to this question of preparation um, is actively being pursued by wealth. And uh, I mean, we, I've just become familiar with some of these. Um, I mean, while the damage to the environment continues and the extraction continues, the extraction is now being used to fund these exorbitant underground bunkers and uh, cities and so you would think that seeing that we are about to go into catastrophe some of these people will wake up but it's actually the opposite of that. Ah, I can speak to this. Here's here's what I've experienced. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I'm trying to raise funds for my work to include uh, increase my staff and my my voice and viability and I've approached some very wealthy people, billionaires and said, would you give some money to support this effort? And most of them are like, they have a billion dollars and they're maybe giving a half a million dollars to initiatives uh, total. And here's why, and this gets back to the eye of Sauron and the power, is in a society that reveres power and that people's limbic systems are damaged or whatever, they feel somehow that more of something will save them. So, and I, and I know this in spades because I used to manage money for them. And they had $500 million and they're like, Nate, I would get to 600 million, I'm buying an island and I'm quitting and I'm gonna do philanthropy. And they got to 600 million and their buddies had more and they kept going, it was a compulsion. And so right now, if you have a billion dollars, that is a claim, it is fungible, on anything in the world. You can instantly turn it into land or a corporation or gold or Bitcoin or move to another country. And that is called optionality. These wealthy people crave the option of doing more, which is why I firmly believe they should be spending down their wealth towards a pro-social outcome and helping the world navigate the bottlenecks of the 21st century. And Cognitively, they might be able to understand that, but emotionally, they want the optionality. Is that good? Yeah, you're speaking now, so I... Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, famine. Yeah, famine. Um, of course, we're using natural gas and the Haber-Bosch process to generate artificial nitrogen. Um, 80% of the nitrogen in your body and 50% of the protein in your body came from natural gas fossil fuels, if you're an average human. Um, because this is what we've pulled out of the ground and added to boost our food supply. So when oil and gas decline this century, which they inevitably will, that will be a removal of fertilizer for food and probably pesticides and other things. So our crop yields will go down, uh, et cetera. Now we'll still be innovating and coming up with new things, but that innovation will likely be swamped by the magnitude of the, the drop in inputs. I don't think that's happening imminently, but everything else being equal, I would say that in my writing, I talk about a giga famine the second half of this century. Okay. Um, now, it doesn't have to be that way. Vandana Shiva is a good friend of mine. She lives in the north of India, and she's very proud of the culture and the communities of people that spend 80% of their time growing nutritious, including micronutrients, 
food locally without any fossil fuel inputs. But A, that requires a lot more time. It, like we need a lot of people spending most of their time in the fields because you need to do all the regenerative practices and such. Very healthy, not only the food, but the activity is very healthy, but that means less accountants and doctors and lawyers and programmers and all that stuff because we need more people working the land. Um, and then the second thing is, even if we had food for 8 billion people without fossil fuels, we would still need lights and fans and trips and shelters and, and everything else. So my personal view, even though you didn't ask this question, is human population is going to increase uh, in the coming 10 or 20 years to 9 billion, 9.5 billion, unless the four horsemen come first. Um, but the second half of this century, we're going to go much lower than that, which is not in the UN forecast. The UN forecast says we're going to 10 billion, but I think most of those forecasts are energy blind. This is a big deal for India. I mean, India has a billion and a half people. Um, I, I don't know what to say about that in the next hundred years, you know? Um, but I think energy and ecosystems is, is very, very important and not often discussed. Sorry, you had a question. And you, sir. And then you, and then you. Oh, Vina is next after her. I'm just curious if you can explain a bit more why the choice of putting the ecological risk separately and slightly disconnected from all the other four. And can this be a, a, an anthropocentric view on this superorganism? What are we missing out on by not acknowledging the, the interconnectedness of all? Well, I have long been a champion for a non-anthropocentric view. I think that is a huge risk and it's the risk I care about most as evidenced by some of my earlier comments. Were you here on Tuesday? I don't know. No, 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 but it's different than the four horsemen because the four horsemen are a human system that is operating, ignoring the ecology. It's operating, it's on its own. So the politics, the war, the money, the complexity, the supply chains and how we in, engage with each other, that is gonna stay together or unravel irrespective of the slow frog boiling uh, you know, climate thing. I included it in there because it's going to increasingly act as a tax on our lives. We're gonna to have to spend more money on air conditioning. We're gonna not be able to go certain places. There's gonna be weather events that we're gonna to have to respond to and that's gonna take time away from other things. So it will be that fifth horseman will add pressure to the other four. But I, I do think it's separate because it's not included in our economic system. So I, I, I'm not being an anthropocentric focus by separating it. I'm just being an analyst trying to look at what the causal things are of the coming decade. I don't know if that answered your question. And it is also unpredictable the Yes, yeah, it's more unpredictable. Although we know, I mean, we can predict a general trend. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I see it so much in all the others. Um, and I so like you, you think that that's going to be dominant, the number five? I, I feel like if we don't have a language for it or a constant awareness on it, for example, we constantly report on the, the casualties of humans with every of these wars, but we never acknowledge uh, the wildlife that has been lost in the country. You're speaking to the choir. You are speaking to the choir. You need to read more of my stuff. My, my question is coming from and where my, my curiosity is that can we actually see it as part of all of them? Either as a... Well, the reason I separated it is it's not... It, it's urgent, but it's not imminent. These other things are imminent that we need to prepare for. The climate and the eco ecosystem has been unfolding for centuries and decades, and it's getting worse and it's horrible, but it's not imminent. There's not a tipping point like these four things. That's why I separated them. Yeah, but let's talk offline because my, my heart and spirit is 100% aligned with what your question was. Vinay, and then over here. I read a book called Super Forecasting and in that book the author says that especially in the US administration most of the decisions are being made 
the kind of a scientific forecasting principles. So all the things what you are predicting uh, are not being predicted by these forecasters in the administration or the policy making. Or, or they're not publicly being discussed in their forecast. I presented to Homeland Security a few months ago and they were blown away by this. And they've been pestering me to give lectures at DHS and Health and Human Affairs because they're completely energy blind. They view the world, as do most government agencies, as a product of technology and money. And that there's some natural law that no matter what problem we're going through now, that technology and, and money will solve it in the long run. And I've talked to a lot of government people that, that believe that. So that's one point is I think our entire system is energy blind because most of the people that are leading the world are either themselves or directly flanked by a PhD in economics, which is the antithesis of a systems analyst. And yes, that's hubristic of me to say, but I have, a, I have hundreds of science systems ecology friends and I've revisited this three times from scratch since 2002 and every time I'm like, this can't be what's going on and I start all over and arrive at the same place. But I could be wrong. I, by definition, humans are, have huge cognitive biases and are delusional. I am human, therefore I also am delusional. I just don't know what I'm delusional about. Just one more thing about this forecasting. What, what is the forecast for a possible nuclear explosion? Okay, so this is something. This is this is something I didn't talk about. What do you think the odds were of a nuclear war from 1960 to 2015? 80 percent. The odds of a nuclear war in the Cold War were 80 percent. But most of us would answer zero because it didn't happen. And that's something called risk homeostasis, is that if something risky doesn't happen, we adjust our behaviors to emotionally to match that. I think in one of my lectures, I gave the example of running a red light on your vehicle 10 times and nothing ever bad happened to you, you are going to behaviorally continue to run red lights. This is true with debt, it's true with the nuclear situation. What do I think the risk is of nuclear war in the next 10 years? 20%, 25%, something like that. Uh, yeah, the 80% is not my opinion. There's been academic papers written about that. Um, it's in my two, 2021 Earth Day talk called Myth and Reality. Um, so I, I think it's larger than the average person expects. But beyond that, I'm just spitballing. I, I don't know. I'm praying that it's zero. Yeah, uh, I think the, these guys had questions first, and then you, and yeah. then Dania. Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Uh, one of the slides you mentioned on the myth that uh, it's a myth that human beings are not selfish, and you had this whole population yeah. slide, yeah. and then there is this scenario playing out of civil war. So, in like, how do you kind of see the scenario of the paradox of both? Uh, well, it's, it's first of all, there's a nature versus nurture thing. And I think our nature is that we're not selfish. We are selfish and cooperative, and we are incredibly behavioral plastic, and culture dictates which direction we go. Our culture, the United States culture, has been very individualistic, and it has attributed our gains and our amazing stuff to our personal efforts. Even Apple Computer, the wondrous technology company, 90% of the components were funded by DARPA within the US government. It was created by government largesse, funded by taxpayers, as one example. Um, so how do I reconcile it is we've lost the type of community that you have in Oroville in the United States where people can get together Friday night and have pizza and music uh, and feel free and able to talk about things. And of course there's problems in Oroville and there's human politics as there is everywhere. But in the United States, we are self-assembling, self-assorting by political 
view. And so the people who disagree with each other, unless they're genetically related, never even come into contact with each other. Um, so I think if we were forced with some dry run of this, like, a, like COVID, uh, then maybe we start to have conversations about what we really care about. But what happened in COVID is we just got stimulus checks and bought Dogecoin and stuff like that and didn't really address the core, core issues. But nope. is there somebody addressing in the US? Uh, oh, there's lots of people that are working on, one of my friends runs a big effort, effort called Civic Resolve, which is ha hosting gatherings and communities for people to talk to each other. This is not unknown. The, the, the risk of AI and the addiction of Facebook and social media and how it's making young teenage girls suicidal and how we're not uh, um, interacting, it's well known in, in our country and people are working on it, but I don't know what the responses are. Yeah, you, sir. Your modeling approach is very energy and material centric. And in one of the slides, you mentioned how uh, the cost of energy extraction itself will go up. Or yep. The energy spent on energy extraction. Yes. The budgets for society will shrink. Yes. Now, my argument is that it's very intersectional, right? It's uh, the crisis is intersectional. We are looking at crisis of water, crisis of food, uh, climate change, you know, many other things, right? Uh, uh, in that context, uh, the cost of food will go up, right? Uh, I will also argue that possibly will shift a uh, uh, shift in how work is valued, right? Maybe we will see financial analysts going bankrupt, right? Finally, so hopefully. But yeah, so uh, do you see that as a possibility and uh, you know something that your model integrates in, in, in its hypothesis or? Well, I think what you're saying is that society is going to value different jobs, yeah. and you're absolutely right. It's already happening now. Um, and I will t hopefully you can come back Tuesday um, because I'm going to give recommendations on that. But yeah, we're going to need um, jobs that are more related to the future that is likely to come, which means some things that are in the leisure, retail, frivolous consumption are not going to be needed or available in the future. A lot more things dealing with basic needs, basic goods, um, local supply chains, things like that are going to be uh, needed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you talk about a lot of it's a systems problem, and institutions are also part of systems, right? And we had a sort of a paid cop. So, do you think the governance of uh, global institutions, especially let's say World Bank, UN, COP, uh, also needs a significant shift to to uh, to navigate the emerging crisis between the two Yeah. The, the question, if you didn't hear it, is um, this is a systems problem, and do the world <laughs> large institutions like um, the UN, uh, World Bank need to change. Of course they need to change, but they're at the top of the current power structure. And this story is, is so anathema to the current structures within those organizations that I don't think they could take it full on. But I think what we could do, and this is an effort that I'm working on in the United States called advanced policy, which is the things that we're gonna need to do cannot be politically or publicly spoken right now, but we can get constituents and people within the government working on them and doing what if scenarios and workshops and break glass in case of emergency blueprints ahead of time. And so I think at those institutions, you could have that. Um, but you know, I, I'm also, I'm always asked this, Nate, if you could press a button and have every of the 8 billion humans understand everything that you believe, would you do it? And I, I think the answer is no, because people generally, a lot of people in my nation have trauma and they're motivated by fear and not a holistic sense of what's going on. And the, the response would be antisocial as opposed to pro-social which is why I want to share this with pro-social people as much as I can now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, one of my takeaways from this is that we have a ratio between the GDP to uh, how much energy is consumed. Yes. And, and um, one of the reasons, and we're evaluating this ratio on a daily basis. And given the amount, the amount of momentum in which like economies have, like, we find it incredibly hard to put a full stop and be like, we're going to transition entirely from a Correct. Uh, economy to uh, green economy. And one of the things that helps Auroville sustain longer is that we have a lower cost of operation, right? 
but as like you said that we do notice C come out here so everyone can hear you sure. um, so we do notice uh, a growing trajectory between um, how how people are normal people are going to get priced out yes so similarly certain communities are going to experience um, a lack of resources uh, due to a lack of energy much quicker than other people. Mm -hmm. So in Auroville, like we notice a circular economy, uh, we, we're quite sustainable. But other economies, how I mean, uh, other communities, how would we notice them adapt? Or like what are possibilities where they can adapt? That's a huge question. <laughs> I, I, th I think you've described the dynamic quite well. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm an expert on the problem. I'm hoping young people like you figure out the responses. But the circular economy in Oroville and the fact that you're resilient to these sort of shocks, that's a really good thing. Most places aren't, but you need to do lots more. Um, so hopefully you can come Tuesday and I'm gonna give my sense of direction, but you've asked an excellent question. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, uh, yes. Um, so Three, and these people also are from Scotland behind you, if you haven't met them yet, but go on. <laughs> um, so there's quite a few forecasts for people's diets um, in, in the years to come that may be less sort of based on only eating more insects or plant-based or whatever it is. If there were some sort of like large change like that, like at a significant level, I would, is that just buying more time or how would that influence the financial situation? I think that's as far as I think it's unlikely that the world will shift away from meat and towards insects on any near-term time frame. I mean, look at China, they're getting more wealthy, they're eating more meat. Um, so a Chinese economic collapse would have a little bit of a benefit there. But I think in the scheme of, of these things that are these four horsemen, I think that's a small one. I think the, the default is that meat will get more and more expensive for a variety of reasons. And so people will be able to afford less. There will be more and more environmentally conscious people that eat less meat, so that will help. Um, from a climate perspective, um, animal agriculture is, is almost up there with fossil fuels as far as its impact, but the majority of that is the finishing of the cow in the last three to six months on, the, on uh, dry distiller grains. The, the rest of its life isn't that huge in terms of and I have colleagues of mine that say that the full on carbon cycle, if you have free range cattle that poop and fertilize the, the grass and then cycle that is actually healthier, but we clearly have to eat less meat as a global society. But that's one of those things that we should do, but I don't think it's actually gonna happen. Um, I've eaten sandwiches made with worms and cricket flour, and I thought they were okay. Um, but I wouldn't like rush out after this and go get one. I'd rather have some paneer or something. Yeah, Danya. You said aggregates ultimately the capita consumption of energy and materials need to reduce. Yep. Not needs to reduce, will reduce. Will reduce. Yeah. Also, if we want to have a viable, sustainable planet. Yes. It needs to be. Correct. But those are two separate statements. Yeah. You also said that the ultra-rich are not willing to redistribute their resources. For the most part. Of a more sustainable planet. Correct. In between that, we have the, the effort of the United Nations to promote the sustainable development goals. My question is, you must have looked at that. How relevant are the sustainable development goals inherently of taking us in the right direction and how successful can it be if we have the ultra-rich not being on board and the majority of the population in the world not being ready to say we are able to go to a lower sort of like consumption. I think sustainable development goals are like a marketing ploy. I don't think they're really relevant to the future that, it, that I see coming. It's a political you know, marketing campaign Yet there's a lot of focus on that. In the United yeah, because it's socially acceptable to focus on that. And similarly, we have COP28, COP27, COP29. Yep. And I think now, this year, people's really started to realize how crazy BS those COP things are. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think next year, whatever the one is next year, it's, it's going to be different, I expect. 
But, but here's the thing, you know, I, I care mostly about climate change and other species. But if we do that, if we value nature and put a price on carbon and put a price on everything, we still have to go through the four horsemen. Which is why I'm focused on that, because no matter what we end up doing, we're going to have to prepare communities and nations for, for this financial unraveling of, of the, the overconsumption and overspending that we've had the last 50 years on credit cards. But in a sense, then the COP28 and so on, and the SOTs are blinders. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a socially acceptable conversation that gives the appearance that we care about the issues going on in the planet, climate change, inequality, sustainability, but the teeth and the reality are, are not really there from, from the lens of this presentation. Yeah. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, a few more questions. Yes, sir. So we've been like for the last five sessions, we've been talking about problems or understanding the depth of the problem. And now we are going to talk about the solution in the, you are going to give some recommendations. Responses, yeah. not solutions. Yes. Uh, the question and, I'm gonna, and I may start Tuesday by asking all of you what you think the solutions are, but go on. Uh, one is that what do you feel about that most of the conversation is somehow coming from the brain? And you started your lecture that about the feeling and everything. Uh, what are the other agencies that can understand the problem? Not just the brain and the data and the research and, and you know that, I mean, and I totally believe because I've been noticing you that uh, you are very grounded and you believe in those other agencies because you have been somehow pointing at those. So I'm not coming from that space. And other is that I also feel that in your articulation that you understand that the problem is this that we can look at, but we are humble enough to understand that there is something unknown that we cannot comprehend. And the, the recommendations or the solutions might be reinforcing the problem. So, I mean, what is your take or understanding about this lens uh, and the other agencies for sure? My initial take is that's one of the most eloquent questions I've ever received in all these years. Um, I'm here to learn about other modalities. That's why I'm in Oroville. Um, I have a big problem, of course, because the story that I'm professionally put together over the last 20 years generates feelings in other humans who hear it that is kind of unavoidable. This is not a funny thing unless you do sitting in the audience. Um, and so I, I, struggle, I struggle with that. Uh, and yet, what I firmly believe is that we have to understand our situation because so many people are like, oh, we just need to build more solar panels and everything else will be fine. The conversation, the ask of us as individuals and as communities and as nations is so much larger than the environmental movies are, are showing. It's way, way bigger. And I'm trying to convey that. But I totally agree with you that we will not solve this with our heads. We will have to solve this, respond to it with our hearts and our hands as well. And I'm still learning on that, all that myself. Because I, as I've learned from my coaches and my experience here the last three weeks, I apparently have spent 90% of the last 20 years in my head and parts of my body don't are disconnected from my head. So my understanding these last five lectures and being able to convey it in a condensed way has taken a physical toll on my being. And I'm trying to, to fix that. I think ultimately we need to have people in the same room who think with their head and with their heart and somehow have them able to have facilitated discourse. And I don't know how, how we do that. But I think, you know, one thing that I'm feeling with the group that I'm with here in Oroville is, and I've known this already. Oh, let me tell you this. Here's something I've been thinking about the last couple of days. 
in sustainability and uh, climate and resilience, there's a lot of talk about community. We need to have a community because community, we can share tools and we can build things together and we can plant a garden. And I think all that's great. That's what I've been thinking. But now I'm starting to realize that the real benefit of community is how it makes me feel sitting with other humans and singing or chanting or talking or humming. And when I leave that, I feel like a different physical entity that is able to do other things in the world. So I think the real benefit of community is, is almost that. And the other stuff is secondary, but I'm still processing that. So I don't know if I answered your question. I'm saying that maybe I might have articulated it wrong or a bit skewed, but I'm just saying that I really value this robust understanding of and lots of data and understanding of the problem so that, and this is one way of looking at the problem. And as you said, there is diversity. People are looking at the problem differently through different lenses and when they come together there are higher chances that we have more holistic understanding of the solution maybe people with different modalities don't ever need to see this yeah. that's an open question to me and i've struggled with that because i'm like dude you gotta see how but maybe we, j we don't need to know all that. We just need to move in a direction that's more linked to the best things in life are free after basic needs are met and, and those sorts of things. So therefore this story is really important, but it's not for everyone um, is another way of what you're saying maybe. Last comment is that <clears throat> when you said that the brightest minds, I mean, that gave some sort of That's a because maybe the brightest minds are the most destructive minds. Okay. Well, there's no and doubt. The person from the village who's doing amazing stuff and has a different kind of intelligence might come up with some solution. I'm just saying that. that you, you're right. I, know. I will change that in the future. It, it's just kind of a flowery language that I've become accustomed to using, but you're absolutely right. And, and how do we get them? person from the village to be part of this conversation. They wouldn't have understood this, but they would have had something important to contribute. And I, I don't know the answer to that. Yes. Because of you, I've come across your um, Ben Not Break yeah. podcast with Daniel. Yeah. And I mean, he's probably one of the most amazing minds I think I've ever come Yeah, across. I would agree. So, so in some ways, you know, if, and he seems to have a wonderful heart also. He does. So, I mean, actually you've got somebody there who's got an amazing mind and a wonderful heart. Yes. yes. And I think actually people like him may actually help us find a way through this actually because I, he seems to be able to be both compassionate but incredibly rigorous in his explorations. For sure, but he's very, very uh, erudite and uses fancy words that not everyone can understand. And he swears, and he swears a lot too. Yeah. Uh, Shankar Devi. I was discussing this with you uh, the other day. Like you seem to have a lot of hope on Oracle, and even in the talks, you keep repeating like communities like Oracle have a like a future or a, a solution. But uh, I'm also skeptical about this scale of operations in Oracle. Like, is the scale so small that we don't see the problems right now? And if they well, that's for sure. And um, the the lot of uh, glamour that is or that Oracle attracts is because the scale is so small. And if the scale is blowing out, we'll actually end up in the same situation as we are here. Yeah. So, um, my my um, thinking is also about like the things that we discuss in the morning session, morning sessions around the science of satisfaction, for example. Mm -hmm. Like um, things like those, I feel like hold the uh, potential future, and uh, that's something that is not even uh, talked about in all of it. Like we talk about everything the world talks about, and. Um, and if we don't do those things, and uh, I feel like we are only uh, uh, happy with the scale, the, the smaller scale of our world, and not really equipping ourselves for that. Uh, it, it's a great question. Anais was here. Anais just did some interviewing of people on, on their opinions of the future, I think, to do a survey of satisfaction and do kind of a scientific 
survey of how satisfied people and where they're lacking and compare it to others and, and document that, I think it would be really cool. But I agree with you. Um, the superorganism can even reach in to the mother's plans and disrupt them. And it is. Um, okay, so well, let's wrap up for tonight. Thank you all for sitting through this.